Hello friends, and welcome to Sleepy Stem Stories. Oh, and also it's raining. A bedtime podcast about science, technology, engineering and maths for those who have trouble switching off and would rather switch over. I'm Aileen MacDonald, and I represent the M in STEM. I love everything about maths, and I want to share some chill facts about it to help you unwind at the end of the day. So, pour the hot beverage of your choice, bonus points if it's in a novelty mug related to your favourite field of science. I'd love to see a picture, by the way, the nerdier the better. And get yourself cosied up and get ready to relax. Tonight we're talking about imaginary numbers. They are as cool as they sound, but this podcast will not be life-changing. So feel free to drift in and out. You won't miss anything important. Any thoughts or ideas you have will still be valid tomorrow. Big breath in. And out. So... What is an imaginary number? Were mathematicians not happy with the infinity they already had? Did they just need to make up some more? Well, yeah, kind of. Numbers in maths can be grouped in different sets. You're probably familiar with the natural numbers. That's your positive counting numbers. One, two, three, four. And you can keep that game going as long as you want. Some people include zero and some people don't. That controversy is based around the philosophical question can you have none of something? The natural numbers are used to count or order things like one apple, two apple, but can you have zero apples? How is that different from having zero bananas? So you can definitely have nothing. I think we've all been there before, but can you have nothing of something? Anyway, you can imagine the set of natural numbers sitting on a line, marching off to infinity in the positive direction. And every single one of these natural numbers has an alternate evil counterpart, the negative numbers. They sit symmetrically on the number line counting backwards, negative one, negative two, negative three, all the way down to negative infinity. All of these numbers together form the set of integers. Everyone's pretty well in agreement that the integers does include zero. You might have noticed that we have infinitely many positive numbers and infinitely many negative numbers, together making the set of integers twice as big as the set of natural numbers, but they're both infinitely big? Yes, it is true. In maths, we have different sizes of infinity. And I really do welcome the fact that our brains have space for these conflicting ideas. What a life to have. But it goes even deeper. Between every single one of those whole numbers is another infinity, the rational numbers. This doesn't mean down-to-earth numbers that can explain things logically. No, here, rational means ratio. All of these numbers can be written as a fraction, and they can sit on the number line between the integers. Some choice favourites always include one half, one quarter, three quarters, maybe one or two thirds, and 22 over 7, which is incredibly close to one of the most beloved numbers of all time, for no reason, pi, 3.14159. Now, pi itself is not a rational number. It cannot be written as a fraction. So, although it has a place somewhere on the number line, you can't really pinpoint it. You could point to 3.14 on the number line, and it's close, but it is not pi. You could use the 15 digits of pi that NASA uses for their calculations. It's accurate enough for interplanetary travel. Shout out to the five rovers we currently have on Mars. Sojourner, Spirit, Opportunity, Curiosity, and Perseverance. Keep up the good work. You may be far away, but we are still rooting for you here on Earth. And if good vibes can travel at the speed of light, they should receive our thoughts in around 3 to 22 minutes. But even at that accuracy of 3.14159265358979, you haven't actually got pi. You know, even at our current world record of 62.8 trillion digits, (laughs) 
two trillion digits. That's so, so, so close to pi, but it is not pi. Pi is irrational and we cannot pinpoint it on the number line. And even though it's the poster child for this set of numbers, it's not unique. There are other numbers that share this cool property, like square root 2, square root 5, e and tau. Maybe a story for another time. You might think that our number line is filled in. And you are correct. All of these sets together form the real numbers. A continuous line of numbers stretching from negative infinity to positive infinity, containing many different sizes of infinity. But even still, it doesn't contain the answers to all of our questions. There was one seemingly simple little question that forced humans to expand their brains even further. How can you find the root of a cubic function, or aka, how do you square root a negative? As a quick backstory, when you square a number, you multiply it by itself. 3 squared is 3 times 3, which is 9. 4 squared is 16, and so on. Square rooting is when you undo this process. So the square root of 9 is asking yourself, what number could I multiply by itself to get 9? And the answer is 3. Problem solved. But in the wise words of Yoda, there is another. If you square negative 3, that's minus 3 times minus 3, your answer is positive 9. So when we square root 9, you actually have no way of telling whether the original number was positive 3 squared or negative 3 then squared. So in Schrodinger-esque logic, the answer is both. As an aside, this is a really rudimentary way to explain the difference between a lossless and lossy compression algorithm for data. When you square something, you lose some of the information you put in, and the reverse process, square rooting, can't get all of that information back. It's a lossy operation. So back to the problem in hand. How do we square root a negative? Well, we can't. If you want to square root negative 9, you have to ask yourself, what times itself will give me negative 9? That number doesn't exist. 3 squared is positive 9, minus 3 squared is also positive 9. The solution does not exist. Until Italian mathematician Girolamo Cardano came along in around 1545 and said, just imagine if we could. And so was born I, the imaginary unit. I is the square root of 1, and it gives the number line a whole new dimension. That's right, the number line literally has two axes now. We have two dimensional numbers, with a real part and an imaginary part. Now, dear listener, something I always want to be careful about is the mathematicians we remember and celebrate. As with most long-standing academic fields, we have priors for not recognising the contributions of marginalised people. And we are living in the aftermath oh, 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 of not even allowing people of colour or women to contribute. And that's before we get into the whole can of worms that is the money and support someone needs to have around them to take the time to study maths. I've heard people argue that we should just focus on the maths and not on the identities of the mathematicians. But whilst we're still naming things after mathematicians instead of using cool made up words, or even useful nomenclature, then we can't ignore the legacy we are actively upholding. And this is my podcast, so I'm just going to say decolonize maths. Anyway, I did check, and in this case, I don't see any evidence of imaginary numbers before Girolamo Cardinal, and there doesn't seem to be any dispute around him publishing the first ideas of complex numbers. But he did not get it all right, and there are many mathematicians after him who refined the concept and made it the mathematical powerhouse that it is today. In fact, not only did Girolamo not fully map out his concept of imaginary numbers, he really missed a trick and ultimately dismissed them as useless. Oh, how wrong he was. As ridiculous as it sounds, the set of imaginary numbers, which most mathematicians now call complex numbers, is really useful to modern life. We can use it in signal processing, with something called the Fourier transformation, helping people in the music and audio industry recognise peaks and signals and remove background noise. Complex numbers are just a fact of life in electrical engineering. A lot of the calculations they do with AC current and other electrical thingies 
just wouldn't be possible without I. Fluid dynamics, aerospace engineering, MRI machines, anything that involves waves, really. And if you've ever seen a picture of the Mandelbrot set, the popular, colourful, fractal poster on all of the coolest kids' university halls doors, that's made with complex numbers too. Even though real-world applications are cool, they don't fill the same space in my heart as doing maths just for maths' sake, just for fun, to explore. And once you accept imaginary numbers into your mind, you can ask yourself some really fun questions, like, is an imaginary number to the power of an imaginary number also imaginary? Feel free to let your mind wander about that. Think about just how amazing Euler's identity, e to the i pi plus one equals zero, is when you consider that e is an irrational number that goes on forever and ever, i is an imaginary number, and pi is another irrational number. And all together in the form e to the i pi, they are equivalent to negative one. As my maths teacher used to say in high school, what right do you have to expect such beauty? But there it is. We could wonder about whether we can expand our number line into more than two dimensions? Now that we can square root negatives, how many solutions does a cube root have, or a fourth root? If you need to know more about these imaginary numbers, then Grant Sanderson of 3 Blue 1 Brown on YouTube is your go-to person for fantastic visualizations and questions to gain such insights, which I think you can engage with at different depths depending on where you are in your own nerdy mathsy journey. But that's something you can do tomorrow. Go to sleep. I hear that. Hi, Eliane here again. The Bedtime STEM podcast was an idea I wanted to try out, and this is the first one I'd like to do more, both on different maths topics and branching out to other sciences. Just some good nerdy fun presented in a chill way. They say that you should make content that you would want to see in the world, and I want more relaxing maths podcasts, so <laughs> here it is. Since this is essentially the pilot, I'd love to know your thoughts on what topics I should do, what background noises would you like? Should it always be raining? I love rain, but the world contains many wonderful sound sceneries. Should I have guests? Let me know. I'm at Alien on Twitter, that's A-Y-L-I-E-A-N, and you can leave a comment wherever you found this podcast. The technical setup right now is very makeshift and something I'd look to improve in the future if I was going to do more of these. If you enjoyed this and want more but better, then consider supporting me on Patreon. I'm at the start of that journey and it is really much appreciated. Catch you later, calculator. <laughs> <laughs>